Many of us, myself included, have been hoping for a Chaos Undivided faction in Total War Warhammer 3, but never in my wildest dreams would I have expected this level of customization for my legendary lord. Dedicating settlements and battlefield victories to the various gods for various boons, playing as a demon prince and leading the forces of Chaos Undivided is a very unique experience that we're going to be diving into in this video. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking our first proper hands-on look at Total War Warhammer 3. That's right. Thanks to the folks at Creative Assembly, I've been able to sit down with the game and start checking it out in depth, so you can expect a ton of footage and information on this channel between now and release, and of course, beyond. If you like what you see and want to grab the game for yourself, using the store link in the description and pinned comment down below will, as always, support the channel as you grab a key. Now, just as a heads up, I do have timestamps down below so you can navigate the video to whatever topic you find most interesting, and so that you can avoid anything that you might feel is a spoiler. I try to avoid narrative elements as much as possible to save you the trouble though. And with all that said, and no more time to waste, let's begin by taking a look at the introductory cutscene and map flyover to set the tone. A new evil enters the world. A prince of Kislev, reborn a prince of darkness. A champion of the Chaos Gods. Kislev will fall. It will kneel before me. Before Chaos. You think too small for one so powerful. Ah! Have you forgotten, Seer? I kill. Person. Why stop at Kislev when you can give chaos the world? No more twisted words. Wait. Person lives. You lie. Wounded and dying by your hand, but alive. The shadow has him still. <laughs> Bellacor will pay for his betrayal. <laughs> the god bears power. It is yours for the taking. So take it. The realm of chaos cannot be entered. No one can cross the maelstrom. I can. I will guide you back to the Forge of Souls. All I require is one drop of Ursa's blood. Finish the job you started, mighty God Slayer. God Slayer. World Slayer. Person's power is mine. Our goal is clear. The Demon Prince must harness Urson's power and claim the mantle of a god. I have brokered a pact and will guide him to his desire. Advise me, as my brother once did. Take me to the Chaos Realms, or suffer his fate. Prince of Demons, God Slayer, the ruinous powers watch, waiting for you to make your mark on this world. The deeper the scar, the easier it will be to wrest Urson's remnants from Belakor. First, establish a capital. This will alleviate the attrition from which you currently suffer. Your new fortress is all but complete. Claim and dedicate it to one of the Chaos Gods. Yet do not linger, for trespassers approach. Colonists from Nordland attempt to settle the untamable lands. In a mistaken belief, this will quell invasions from the North. Wipe out the gullible fools at their beachhead, the Bay of Blades. Then make the Scalings pay for failing to protect lands that are the dominion of Chaos Undivided. The other Norskan tribes should be conquered and subsumed into your burgeoning realm. 
And across the sea of claws lies even fatter prey. The Empire is within reach, but beyond that fractured nation, the so-called motherland. Kislev, the nation which abandoned you, whose god you had no choice but to slay. The leader of Urson's cult, Kostaltin, musters a force to enact revenge against you. Meet them head on and harvest their miserable lives to power your own vengeance. As you gather your forces, the Tome of Fates ponders a way to return to the Chaos Realms. Your form remains malleable, so use this to your advantage and wield the Legion of Chaos. A prince will become a king, and then a god. The starting situation. Just to the north of Kislev, in the barren icy land, stands your host. Not so grand in its current state, but large enough to tackle initial nearby challenges and set up shop. You'll have the standard opening battle to get things going, and then you'll be able to grab your capital settlement, the abandoned city of Doomkeep. With a mechanic we'll discuss in just a bit, you'll be able to choose which god you want to dedicate the settlement to. Not only will this set an initial tone and approach to your playthrough, it'll also determine which hero type is the first you acquire. Determined by the god you've picked here, you'll either get an iridescent horror of metal or the lore of Zinch, a blood reaper, an Alluris of shadows or lore of Slanesh, or a plague ridden of death or lore of Nurgle. And they'll come through within the first handful of turns to use as you please on the campaign map or on the battlefield. Don't worry too much about setting a precedent with this first conquest outside of your role-playing choices. It's not like you have to permanently commit to the god that you dedicate the city to or anything. With Doom Keep having a marble resource, and marble mining being a resource that appeals to Zinch, I'd suggest dedicating Doom Keep to Zinch, then again he's my favorite chaos god, so there might be some bias there. You'll be at war with your neighbors to the south, and you'll want to move pretty quickly in eliminating them, establishing cities in the name of other gods to gain access to a greater variety of units. Your first army starts with your own melee self, some bloodletters of corn, two units of nurglings, a unit of marauders of slanesh, two units of blue horrors, and a unit of pink horrors, with a unit of seekers, a unit of plague drones, and a unit of chaos warhounds. It's a pretty balanced opening army with a bit of melee, a bit of range, a bit of cavalry, and some great mobility too, but you want to make sure you're able to recruit replacements when you start taking damage. And you can't do that if you don't have enough cities and favor with the gods. Again, something we'll discuss in more detail in just a little bit. You'll want to get a second army relatively quickly and push south, and at the same time, you'll want to try and take advantage of the new diplomacy options, seeking out non-aggression pacts and eventually defensive alliances with at least one Norskan tribe, and perhaps the Skaven to your east. If you can secure these defensive alliances, or better yet, full military alliances, you'll be able to build outposts at their provincial capitals, and since none of these factions are likely to expand, the first one to ally them will be the only one to have access to these outposts, since outposts can only be built at provincial capitals, and these guys will only really have the one. Outposts will give you access to units from the faction to use in your own armies, and it'll invite the ally to build outposts in your provincial capitals too, gaining access to your units, but adding to garrisons in those cities as well. Higher level outposts give access to higher level units, but are only available in full military alliances, or if you have a vassal. These units cost allegiance points to recruit, so you'll need to keep an eye out for allied missions that might earn you some to recruit with, or of course you can just patiently wait as allegiance points accumulate over time. The reason I think these alliances are helpful early on is to fill out your roster as you wait to gain glory with the gods. Your wars to the south extend past your immediate neighbors. Kislev, the Wood Elves, and some other neighboring Norskins all hate you, and you're going to want to get ahead of that, especially since the Kislevite and Wood Elf factions have no qualms in traveling across the water to hit you right at home. Your alliances, or your natural expansion, will eventually put you head-to-head -head with your neighboring Chaos Demon factions too, with Scarbrand's exiles being the most likely to push into your and your allies' territories based on where they start. The very different mechanics can make the Demons of Chaos a challenging start the first time you play as you try to wrap your head around all the new elements in the game, and for the faction specifically too, so why don't we dive into some of these unique faction mechanics that'll dominate your gameplay. 
Gaining glory for the gods. One of the key aspects of playing as the demons of chaos led by the demon prince is generating glory for the various chaos gods, choosing eventually to either align with one or to remain entirely unaligned. Missions will come by as they do in a Total War game and they will provide you a relatively constant supply of glory. Sometimes the glory will be spread between all four gods and Chaos Undivided alike, and sometimes the glory reward will prioritize one or two gods over another. Typically, this is thematically appropriate. Hurting the collective enemies of Chaos might give glory to all the gods, while the Confederation mission will glorify Slanesh most, and a growth-related mission might glorify Nurgle in particular, so on and so forth. While you might choose the order in which you pursue some of these missions to focus on your preferred god, the fact of the matter is that, more often than not, you're going to ignore the mission itself and do what needs to be done to win the game. Whether you care for the glory of Korn or not, chances are you'll eventually raise an additional army because you'll just have to, and you'll get that glory gain inevitably. If you did want to focus on a specific god or otherwise accelerate their glory gain though, there are a few things you can do. Defeating any enemy in a field battle will give you the option to sacrifice the captives in the name of any one of the gods, and for Chaos Undivided as well. Capturing or colonizing a settlement will allow you to dedicate the settlement to a specific god, which will give you a one-time increase to their glory, and then within those settlements, you'll have access to an infrastructure building chain that increases the glory of that god by a certain amount per turn, and you'll also have access to an advanced military building chain that unlocks unit recruitment and also helps generate glory for the god that that settlement is dedicated to. You'll have access to other building options as well, but these are the ones that help generate more glory. Beyond that, certain resources can be tapped into in order to generate glory for specific gods. This is independent of who the city itself is dedicated to, so marble will always generate glory for Zinch, logs will always generate glory for corn, so on and so forth. Again, it doesn't matter who the city itself is dedicated to, the resource and its acquisition will generate glory consistently for the god that it's most appealing to. Finally, once an entire province has been conquered, you can enact commandments that give various boons while also adding to glory of the various gods. Beyond simply acquiring the glory itself, you can choose to upgrade your legendary lord with skills that increase glory gain. Glorious Warfare is a 3 level skill that increases glory gain by 3, 8, and then 15% across the board while each of the rest you see highlighted here do the same increase of 3, then 8, then 15% for Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh, and Zinch, respectively. We'll come back to the screen in a bit, don't worry. But before we get too distracted by skills, I do want to talk about... Demonic Glory and Unlocking Units While higher level buildings are a necessity for the acquisition of higher level units, as is always the case, Demonic Glory is the final arbiter of which units you'll be able to recruit or not, with your dedication to each of the gods determining what you can or cannot have. So even if you've built the necessary building, if your Demonic Glory with a god isn't high enough, you still won't be able to recruit the unit until it is. Though the game states Demonic Glory gives you access to Demonic Units, it also gives access to some mortal units when and where applicable, so yes, you will have access to things like the Marauders of Slanesh or the Chaos Warriors of Korn, so on and again, so forth. It's like the fourth time I've said that in this video, I'm sorry. Do note that you won't be able to recruit any units right at the start of your campaign, partly because you don't start with a settlement, but also because it takes a minimum of 35 glory to gain access to the first unit of any of the gods. To be fair, you'll have access to Furies, but they're pretty flimsy and I'm not counting them for this statement over here. Either way, you'll gain that glory quickly enough, but it does mean that your first battle victory and your first settlement will determine your initial composition at least for a couple of turns. We'll touch on some of these other unlocks in later parts of the video, again, timestamps are available down below to skip around as you wish, but in the interest of keeping things organized, let's stay focused on units for now, with the unit cards and abilities and details all on screen for you to peruse through. Keep in mind that your starting units we discussed in the previous section provide a pretty balanced opening army, with a bit of melee, a bit of range, a bit of cavalry, and again some mobility as well. So you can absolutely pick your initial glory choices based on preferred playstyles and gods rather than pure utility. At 3080 glory though, you have to either dedicate yourself to a god or commit to being undivided, locking up the other progression tracks. Doing the latter, 
committing to Undivided will still get you all of the units, but you'll be locked out of certain other benefits that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Keep in mind also that demonic units will all cause magical damage, have physical resistance, and will never retreat from battle, but will instead crumble and disintegrate similar to undead units in prior games, just under different names. They also all cause fear and are immune to terror. So keep all that in mind as we talk about these units, so I don't have to repeat myself over and over for things that remain consistent across the board. Korn's demons also have spell resistance of 25%, and Korn is who we're going to discuss first. Chaos Warhounds come in at 35 glory, followed by Flesh Hounds of Korn at 110 glory. These are both fast war beasts capable of vanguard deployment, the first being a mortal unit, and the latter being demonic, though it has a 50% spell resistance rather than the usual 25. Blood Letters are at 330 Korn glory, Chaos Warriors of Korn at 440, Blood Shrines at 660, finally introducing cavalry in the form of chariots, with Chaos Warriors of Korn with dual weapons at 880 glory, and with halberds at 990, finally bringing in some anti-large capabilities. The Gore Beast Chariot is available at 1320 glory, and then there's a huge wait until the Exalted Blood Letters at 1760, before you get the spawn of Korn at 1980. Do note that the spawn of Korn is the last of the spawns you can get access to, and it's unique in that it has the Rampage ability. The stats on each of the spawns is a little different too, with Korns being the weakest in melee defense, but strongest in melee attack. The Skull Cannon then comes in at 2090 Korn Glory, finally introducing ranged capabilities in the form of armor-piercing artillery, with the Minotaurs of Korn coming at 2420 and Blood Crushers at 2750. After dedicating yourself to Korn at 3410 glory, you'll have access to the Minotaurs of Korn carrying great weapons. These guys are armor-piercing and anti-large and very terrifying units. Then, at 3740 glory, you'll have access to these Skull Crushers of Korn. Again, armor-piercing and very well-armored, much more significantly armored than almost any other unit in this entire roster, coming in with bronze shields as well. Following them is the Soul Grinder of Corn, available at 4,180 glory, and this is actually a bit of an artillery piece, with a fantastic missile strength, a decent range, and decent melee stats to go with them as well. Finally, the Bloodthirster becomes available at 4,400 Corn glory, giving you access to more anti-large armor-piercing damage with flaming magical attacks and just fantastic melee stats overall. Korn is among the fastest to unlock the most units, and though he lacks ranged capabilities outside of artillery, the Minotaurs and mortal units provide those loyal to him some versatility, and he's the Chaos God with the largest roster on the team. All Nurgle units cause poison damage, which can be a pretty significant debuff, and the demon units of Nurgle specifically also have the Cloud of Flies passive ability that buffs melee defense when engaged in melee. Some of the earliest Nurgle units work great as extremely slow hammers to extremely resilient anvils. The Nurglings are available at 35 glory, followed by the anti-infantry Plague Toads at 110. Plague Bearers of Nurgle come in at 330, and then there's a gap until 660 where you get the armor-piercing, regenerating Beast of Nurgle. The AP on this thing is the largest you can get the soonest, and the Slime Trail can help prevent enemy escapes and charges. Rot flies arrive at 880 glory, and then there's a fairly long wait again until you get the Exalted Plague Bearers at 1,210 points. Your first ranged unit, if you go purely Nurgle, in with armor piercing and poisonous ranged attacks that cause magical damage, but they have very little ammo. They're really more of a melee unit that can pop some shots off, really. At 1,650 glory is the Forsaken of Nurgle. At 1,870, the spawn of Nurgle, and then another significant wait until you finally get the Pox Riders of Nurgle at 2,420 glory, anti-infantry. After that, you have to wait until you dedicate to Nurgle before you get access to the Plague Drones at 3,410 glory, the Plague Drones Death's Heads at 3,740 with added missile capabilities, the Soul Grinder at 4,180, your first somewhat sustainable ranged unit, and finally the Great Unclean One at 4,400 glory. 
Nurgle's entire roster is extremely slow, but it has a mix of range and infantry, though it lacks artillery capabilities. Ironically, contrary to their overall slow speed, they are one of two Chaos Demon rosters that have dedicated airborne units and whose heroes and lords have access to dedicated airborne mounts, the other being Zeech, but more on him later. First, let's take a look at Slanesh. All Slaneshi mortal units are immune to psychology and all Slaneshi demons have the devastating flanker trait, making them excellent units to get rear and side charges with as it doubles the charge bonus when attacking from these directions. Marauders come in at 35 glory with a bonus versus infantry to kick things off, with Hellstriders bringing cavalry pretty quickly at 110 glory, being the earliest you can have access to anti-large capabilities on the ground. Vanguard deployment is great paired with their speed, and Soul Hunters means that the more they kill, the better they perform. The Demonettes come in at 330 glory, bringing armor piercing and being the first to bring that devastating flanker trait we talked about, with the Marauders of Slanesh with spears coming in at 440 glory as the first anti-large infantry unit this entire faction has access to across the four gods. Hell Scourges come in at 660 glory, and they're also among the highest melee defense stats across all the Slaneshi units bar one, so they might be your best anvil for a Slanesh dedicated army early on. At 990 glory, you get the Hell Striders of Slanesh as Hell Scourges. At 1320 glory, you get the Exalted Demonettes, the highest melee defense stat among Slaneshi units, and with a Soul Sent passive making them more powerful when enemy units are wavering nearby. They also have the Charmed effect in their melee attacks, reducing enemy melee attack when they're hit. Seekers come in at 1,540 glory, the Spawn at 1,760, the Seeker Chariot at 1,980, and the Heart Seekers at 2,310. After a fairly long gap, there's the Fiends of Slanesh at 2,750 glory, and then you have to dedicate to Slanesh in order to get the Hell Flares, the Exalted Seeker Chariot, the Soul Grinder, or the Keeper of Secrets. Slanesh has one of the fastest rosters. The infantry is pretty quick, but the cavalry, mortal or not, are all the fastest units among the Demons of Chaos bar one, the Flying Doom Knight of Zinch with a speed of 105. Slanesh's roster lacks any flight of its own, so you can't take advantage of shortcuts open to others, but that extra efficient flanking means more damage to HP, which means more damage to morale, which means breaking enemy units much more quickly, body and mind. Slanesh also completely lacks ranged capabilities, even when compared to Korn, who at least has some artillery. Slanesh is all about up-close and personal melee fighting, despite the typically paltry armor and the often lacking melee defense. Zinch is, sadly, in some ways the most underrepresented of Chaos Demons factions, with just 9 units before dedication and then 4 after, like everybody else. All Zinch units have barriers which absorb damage before the health bar takes any hurt, and the barrier will replenish proportional to remaining health if the unit stops taking any damage. Units don't have a consistent unique element, whether mortal or not, but you'll see a fair bit of fire damage more often than not. Blue Horrors, available at 35 glory, are the earliest ranged unit you can get, and they're not terrible in melee if you manage their barriers well enough either. With Arced Fire, they can shoot over walls and units and obstacles in general, and are quite a valuable tool. At 110 glory are the Screamers of Zinch, airborne anti-large units with vanguard deployment, making them the most mobile anti-large units early on, though flyers can get stuck in combat very easily at times, so there is a bit of a risk there. After a bit of a wait, you'll get the Pink Horrors at 440 glory, better than Blue Horrors in every way, still acting as a ranged infantry unit. Then there are the Forsaken at 660 glory, and the Spawn at 880, coming in with Armor Sundering. Then there's a bit of a wait again as you get to the Exalted Pink Horrors at 1,210 glory, an even better ranged infantry unit, even more capable in melee as well, and bringing Arcane Mirth to help with recharging the Winds of Magic too. Another long wait later are the Flamers of Zinch at 1,650 glory, with their unique Warp Flame status that they can apply in range and in melee, causing a reduction in armor and a huge increase to weakness to fire damage. Flamers work great from range, and they might just melt away in melee. 
Now shortly thereafter come the Chaos Knights at 1870 glory, which is the most heavily armored of Demons of Chaos units, on top of having that Zinch protective barrier. Exalted Flamers come after another long wait at 2420 glory, and their missile strength is through the roof, but their range means you'll have to take risks with them considering their poor melee stats. Now after a tremendous wait, and only if you dedicate yourself to Zinch, will you have access to Doom Knights of Zinch, heavily armored with silver shields and the fastest speed in the roster alongside Vanguard deployment, all available at 3410 glory. With a Burning Chariot giving you all the stats of an Exalted Flamer just in the air at 3740 glory. The Soul Grinder comes in at 4180 with Armor Piercing, Anti-Large, all from a great range, and the Lord of Change comes in at 4400 glory with a high weapon strength, decent melee stats, and the blue and pink fires of Zinch. Zinch has flying units, infantry, ranged, cavalry, chariots, and artillery if you choose to dedicate yourself to him. Somehow he has the fewest units, but he has the greatest versatility, very fitting for his themes, I suppose. The barrier makes him a very fun hit-and-run type of faction and make his units all reliant on those hit-and-run tactics to try and keep them alive, to try and keep their barrier at full strength at all times, and the existence of the barrier doesn't come with paltry health pools or anything either. But units aren't the only reason to gain favor with a god. Customizing your Legendary Lord and Faction Though customizing your Legendary Lord begins with giving him a custom name, it obviously goes well beyond that. Your Legendary Lord is the Demon Prince, a fully customizable Lord who can attain gifts from the various gods through loyalty to them, and can then mix and match said gifts to best pursue his goals. The head, the torso, the wings, each individual arm, the legs, the tail, and the weapons can all be swapped in and out with just a few clicks, and this makes you a very versatile killing machine, able to adapt to an upcoming battle immediately before you dive into it. You don't need to be garrisoned or in a specific stance or within your own territory or anything, you just swap away as needed. To actually unlock these parts though, you'll need to attain glory for the various gods. Just like the process unlocks units, so too does it unlock these parts for your legendary lord. Some parts are pieces of a set, and if you use all parts of a set at the same time, you glean additional benefits that you may or may not want to use based on your current circumstances. Some parts will unlock spells, others will buff your Zinch barrier, so on and so forth, and there are a few patterns to look out for. Any spell unlocks will match the lores available to the heroes of that specific god. For example, the Allurus is available to you as one of Shadows or the lore of Slanesh, and so any spells you acquire as abilities from Slaneshi body parts will be from either of those lores. Nurgle taps into Death and the lore of Nurgle, and Zinch taps into the lores of Metal and Zinch. Corn seems to simply have more abilities. We'll get a spread of buffs across the board, and it's not like only Corn's pieces ever buff melee stats, no, but Corn's pieces definitely seem to buff melee stats more consistently, adding abilities or traits that tie into a more aggressive approach, like better charge speeds, better overall speed, higher charge bonuses, better melee attack and defense, and abilities that further amplify those very stats. You'll get the occasional buff to like spell or physical resistance as well, but the For the Slaughter active ability is one of the more interesting pieces from Korn, buffing lords and heroes within a 35 meter radius to do a significantly higher bit of damage while taking significantly less over three phases. The Serpentine Tail direct damage is quite nice too, though it isn't unique to Korn. Zinch has it too. Nurgle's wings often give Pestilent Decay that cause direct damage like the Serpentine Tail does, damage per second in an area around the Demon Prince as long as they're in melee. A lot of Nurgle's parts buff HP and armor, while some will focus on melee defense, ward saves, or missile resistance. Slanesh is all about speed and melee attack and defense in light doses too, but be warned that Slaneshi arm pieces will often prevent you from wielding weapons while using them. Zinch, meanwhile, is all about buffing that barrier and casting spells, though there is a set of wings that provides vanguard deployment as well. Every 110 favor you'll be unlocking new parts, and after you dedicate yourself to a god or dedicate yourself to being undivided, you'll be unlocking new parts every 220 favor when undivided, or every 110 still if you pick a specific god. 
you'll notice that some of these later options unlock multiple pieces at a time too. Every angle has its merits, and the lanes all seem decently balanced against each other, and with a bit more experimentation, some pretty powerful builds will make themselves self-evident. Stacking a few area-based direct damage passives when in melee, for example, is a very powerful tool, and swapping weapons around to meet your tactical needs is certainly something to keep top of mind. You know, if you're about to go into battle with a bunch of dwarfs, maybe it's not time to carry in that anti-large weapon, and maybe you should swap in for some anti-infantry armor piercing instead. And the fact that you can actually do this at a moment's notice is pretty cool. There's a lot of fun to be had with experimentation, I think, but Units and parts aren't the only things you unlock through glory. You may have noticed these icons from time to time. These act as further unlocks as you earn glory for a god. The most important ones are probably at 550 glory across the board, except for Nurgle, who gets it at 440, unlocking hero recruitment for each of the god's heroes. The other extremely important ones worth chasing are at 770 glory across the board, unlocking the Chaos God's specific mechanics for your own faction. Horn's bloodletting, Nurgle's plagues, Slanesh's ability to seduce enemy units before battle, and Zinch's teleport stance that lets you navigate the world more freely. These are all very powerful tools, and unless you're completely averse to spreading glory around, I'd suggest at least getting to this point so you have all the toys at your disposal. Further down, Corn is good for a warmonger trying to retain control and gain income while raiding, and gets buffs for Cornate units. Nurgle improves casualty replenishment rates and improves income from raising settlements, followed by buffs for some of his units. Slanesh increases the casualties captured after battle, and just bumps control by one, followed by, you guessed it, buffs to some Slaneshi units. And finally, Zinch increases income from sacking settlements and bumps ambush defense chance by a whopping 25%, followed by buffs to Zinch specific units as well. Just before you dedicate yourself to a god, you get one last set of offerings that buff god specific units that you will have unlocked by this point. All other boons come after dedicating yourself to a god, and they follow a pattern. First, you get buffs to units, then you get buffs to recruitment ranks and a campaign element, and finally you get upkeep cost and recruitment cost reductions for the gods' units, alongside buffed recruitment ranks and a special army ability that lets you summon a god-specific unit twice in a battle. Gifts from the gods manifest in other ways too, as skills and improvements to your units and realm. The Demon Prince Skill Tree the Demon Prince skill tree is divided amongst the gods and unaligned, and the first skill to get is Glorious Warfare, increasing glory gain by 15% across the board when you upgrade it a third time. You can then divert to the gods who you want to focus on if there is one, getting additional buffs to their glory gain, or you can spread your love equally to unlock the next section across the board. The first two skills in this section all have either a faction-wide or Lord's Army-specific impact, with the third skill in this section focused on buffing units available early on for each specific god's track. Chaos Undivided buffs control at this spot instead, followed by buffing diplomatic relations with appropriate factions in the fourth spot, where every other track gives buffs to Reign of Chaos, a mechanic I'll explain in the next section. Then there's Route Marcher at the top, good old-fashioned extended campaign movement range, but god-specific tracks will see a 15% reduction in upkeep cost for their units in the Lord's Army. Chaos Undivided here gets to its last track, bringing the new Lightning Strike, which no longer prevents enemy reinforcements completely, but instead makes them take much longer to arrive on the battlefield. Then, across three skill points each, you can get up to a 15% reduction in upkeep costs for the god-specific units in the Lord's Army. The god-specific tracks, meanwhile, start with more campaign-related boons, better experience gain from Corn, better replenishment rate from Nurgle, better ambush success chance from Slanesh, and better diplomacy from Zinch. Then, you've got additional buffs for god-specific units in the Lord's Army for the next two steps. Next is another step of improved Reign of Chaos numbers, unlocking the final part of the track. Outside of Zinch, these are all buffs to units that you'll only have access to if you dedicate yourself to a specific god. Zinch buffs these units primarily too, though there are some buffs to the Exalted Flamers who are available before dedication. 
as you can see, it's not a bad idea to have a game plan early on with regards to which units you're planning on using and which god you're planning on focusing on, but at the same time, there is a good reason to spread the love here if you want to remain unaligned. With that said, there's one last thing to touch on, and that's the Reign of Chaos. While upgrading your Demon Prince's skills, you'll sometimes have the option to increase the chance of gifts from a specific god in the form of Reign of Chaos. This is actually a battlefield mechanic for the Demons of Chaos that gives you army abilities if you engage in combat with your lord. It encourages you as the player to throw your commander into the thick of things, using either magic or actual physical combat to do damage and fill this bar up. As it fills up, you'll unlock army abilities, and you have a random chance of drawing one from the four gods. You can modify these chances by getting the skills that bump them up appropriately. There are some very powerful abilities, but situationally, there are some really unlucky ones you can end up with too. Fortunately, a bit of patience will unlock a second and even a third option, each more powerful than the last. Using an ability drains the bar though, completely, so if you want access to those higher level options, you'll have to hold off on using the abilities that become available early on, and once you do use that higher level action, you'll lose access to all of the army abilities until you refill the bar to the appropriate threshold. It's a pretty simple mechanic, but it is unique to this faction and it might influence some of your skill choices. It's also an interesting way to tie in your dedication to the battlefield beyond just the units you have on hand. These are gifts from the gods that you're getting in the middle of battle, and your dedication to the gods in the form of skill points will reflect which ones favor you more. Whether you choose to remain undivided or you pledge your allegiance to one of the Chaos Gods, the Demons of Chaos provide an interesting challenge and a fun set of unique mechanics unlike anything we've seen before in Total War, Warhammer or otherwise. I hope you found this video informative. It's a dense one, but if you liked it, don't hesitate to let me know down below. And if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them as well in the comments, of course. There's a lot more Warhammer 3 coverage inbound on this channel, and if you're interested in anything specific, make sure to let me know down below too, and of course, subscribe if you haven't already. As I'd mentioned earlier, feel free to grab the game with the link in the description down below if you'd like to support the channel as you buy it. But apart from that, as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.